Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. My guest today is award-winning composer and multi-instrumentalist musician Pat Irwin. He has been gracious enough to come to talk with me about his career and his music. Throughout his career, Pat has been a part of many iconic and influential musical projects. From his early days in New York City, being a founding member of the influential no-wave bands The Ray Beats and Eight-Eyed Spy, to his years performing with the iconic B-52s and his current ambient country band, Sus. Throughout his full career, he has also created scores for much-loved television series like Rocco's Modern Life, SpongeBob SquarePants, and Nurse Jackie, just to name a few. His latest project is creating the score for the hit series Dexter, New Blood. The album of this soundtrack was released in October by Lakeshore Records. I am so honored to have him here with me today. So Pat Irwin, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thanks for having me. So as I was reading through your long list of accomplishments, a quote that came up from Robert Palmer in the New York Times, and he called you a mercurial presence on the New York rock scene of the early 80s. And um, addition to the biography that I just read, you also attended composition workshops with John Cage and released the Lost Philip Glass Sessions. And so I can see where he's coming from with, <laughs> with that review of your work, but I think that it actually makes a lot of sense. And it seems that you're always kind of looking for the new and a little bit out of the ordinary music when you're creating music. Is that a pretty fair assumption of mine? I don't know that I'm looking for it. It just happens naturally. Um, I can't really change, change the way I do it, you know, um, no matter how hard I try. Yep. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it just it it just seems to be the way it works for me, the way it way it goes. Um, and I'm, you know, I, luckily I've been able to work on some really great shows and be in some really great bands. Mm -hmm. So, how is it that you choose the projects that you work on? You say it happens naturally, but how does that come about? Well, I don't really choose. Um, these things kind of find me. And I find them. In the case of Eight-Eyed Spy, um, it was George Scott from The Contortions and Lydia Lunch from Teenage Jesus who were friends, and they wanted to form a band together. And they did. And luckily, um, a friend of mine knew George and brought me in. And we rehearsed and wrote songs and did it. Um, this with the Ray Beats, it was uh, Don Christensen and Jody Harris, who were also in the contortions with George. And really, we just all loved instrumental rock and roll music and wanted to form a band. Same thing. We didn't really, you know, it just, you know, with a band, you, you, you just, you put it together. It's sort of like, us versus the world, um, if you will. In the case of the B-52s, I knew Kate and had met Fred. The Ray Beats had opened for the B-52s on some shows. Even further back than that, uh, I had lent them my amplifier. I knew... We, again, because of mutual friends, they needed an amplifier for one of their first shows, their first show at the Mud Club in New York City. And I lived at the end of the alley. And um, I lent them my amplifier. And um, so that, you know, 10 years later, when um, it came time to put a band together and tour behind Cosmic Thing, we Kate gave me a call. And... You know, it didn't, it wasn't much of a decision. It was like, yeah. But I, what I remember really clearly was that Kate said it was going to be three weeks long, maybe six weeks. I mean, we weren't really sure that anybody was going to show up. And needless to say, the first B-52s tour lasted 18 months. 
And it went from playing little clubs like where I think our, well, no, we played a party in the basement of a, of a, of a restaurant. And then we played CBGBs and a bunch of other little clubs. And we started to go across the country and the record company called up and said, uh, fly back, come on back. Um, why don't you do a video? And we made the video for Love Shack and then went back out. And without knowing it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. I don't think it you can so go to cool. a wedding without hearing Love Shack, even now. What's that? <laughs> I don't think you can even go to a wedding anywhere without hearing Love Shack no, now. Can you believe it? I mean, <laughs> that song is is everywhere. And that more to the power of the B-52s, that that music is in the air to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, what a great band. And then in the case of uh, of uh, film and television, it's the same thing. I don't really decide to do things. You know, um, the very first show that I worked on, television show I worked on, was called Tales from the Dark Side. And I was living, you know, in, in my neighborhood at the time in New York City, in uh, Queens, actually, it was around the corner from where Tales from the Dark Side was sh- being shot. And the, the producer recognized me on the street. He was a fan of the Ray Beats. So really? Kind of my kind of networking. I just <laughs> walked, down the, walked down the street. <laughs> you know, luckily, I didn't have to do a whole lot. He said, you want to do it? And I said, yeah. And I was actually about to leave the next day for Georgia. I was producing a band in Atlanta called Love Tractor who were also from Athens, like, like oh, okay. uh, the Bees and R.E.M., Pylon. And um, so I did this first episode that I worked on from Tales from the Dark Side. I actually did it at night in the studio after working on this record. But I loved it. I always wanted to do that. But I was completely naive. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. And... Um, and at the same time, per your comment about Robert Palmer, I had been working with uh, choreographers. I had composed some music for some dance performers um, at the same time, now that I'm thinking about it. And um, this per- that performance that Robert Palmer went to was at Dance Theater Workshop. And... Uh, so he reviewed the show, which was great. He was a fan of the Ray Beats and Eight-Eyed Spy, which I'm eternally grateful for. And and Robert Palmer, I won't go on, but man, what a writer. Um, a producer from in Atlanta, actually, where you are, from Turner Broadcasting, uh-huh. uh, read the review and wow. in the New York Times and asked if I wanted to compose the score for a Turner Broadcasting, which is a brand new network at the time, mm-hmm. a documentary. And I ended up scoring a couple of those documentaries. And wow. that was how, how that started. I mean, those were the first things I did. All from networking and people you know. and Yeah. And but I mean, it wasn't really networking. It was just playing in the clubs. Mm-hmm. And I'm still friends with those people now. Those, you know, the the scene was so wonderful, and hmm. people that I had met in, in those first bands I was in, I'm still friends with now. Same with the B52s, you know. Um, so it, I guess it is networking, but it's not like going to uh, an industry event, right? But anyway, yeah. Well, how does that transfer over from? you know, writing music for your bands, for the Ray Beats and things, to scoring for television. Are, is the process the same? I would think it's a little different. Oh, yeah. With a band, you're holding the instrument in your hands and rehearsing. With a film and TV, you're looking at the picture. Um, you're scoring the picture. With a band, you're playing in front of an audience, hopefully. Um, with, uh, with, uh, with scoring the picture, you know, it's a different kind of performance, but it's not in front of an audience that hopefully, again, hopefully will come later. Um, Both are intensely collaborative though. 
and, and they're collaborative in, in ways that intersect. It always sort of surprised me. Um, collaborating is something that I love to do. I love it. And, and um, I love the energy that comes from another person bringing in an idea. And in the case of Dexter, that could, that could be the f- producers who all had really great ideas and specific ideas about the score for Dexter New Blood. With a band, you know, I'm thinking of like Fred, like wanting the, in- for Love Shack, like the intro, like a Motown intro and a party track, you know, just, just working on things, coming up with ideas, being in a band is priceless when it's working. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so that's that's interesting to think about how collaborative being a composer could be, because there's this famous story about Leonard Bernstein composing for a film and how frustrated he got because of the lack of he felt the lack of control and so much of his score got cut. But it seems like you have a much more collaborative approach to composing and for scoring. So what kind of, what kind of approach do you bring to it? It's like if you said in Dexter, the producers had lots of ideas, what was kind of the, the process of creating that score? Well, first of all, with regards to having things being cut, if you're not prepared to have things being cut, you're in the wrong business. It happens all the time. Or in the case of Dexter, I had things that I was submitting very early on, even before I received the scripts, uh, just based on general ideas about what I knew it was going to be, I was sending ideas for feedback. Uh, I, I think, I know composers, it doesn't matter whether they're classical composers, jazz or rock and roll, who aren't ready for that kind of scrutiny. Um, you know, things being cut, not used, changes being made, but it's being made for a film. Uh, and really, actually, I wasn't ready for it when I started out, to be honest with you. Um, I think about it. I wished I had been a little bit more prepared for that. But with Dexter, we knew really early on that we wanted a new, a new sound. We weren't in Miami anymore. And it needed to be different than the original score. Yet at the same time, we wanted to allude to that beautiful theme that Daniel Lick composed. So that, that was a, a challenge. Uh, but I like that kind of challenge. That was a good challenge. First of all, the original was so beautiful and so beautifully composed and recorded. Um, but we knew we wanted a colder, more distant, austere sound. More, And one producer in particular, uh, Marcos Siega, was quite specific in, in, when he told me in, the, in our first meeting that he wanted a more ambient sound. And I knew, at least I thought I knew, yeah, I thought I knew exactly what he meant, or I hoped he knew. And I loved the music from, say, Chernobyl, mm-hmm. um, Trent Reznor's and Atticus Ross's, their score for uh, The Social Network. Mm-hmm. I really love that idea of the sound design being a part of the score. And we wanted to do that right. with Dexter. Yeah, absolutely. So how is that different um, because it is very ambient and it's much more electronic. So I, I would assume that it's the whole recording process is very different for electronic music than, say, a traditional here's the score, send it to musicians type of process. Um, it, it's There are more similarities than differences. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, it's got to serve the picture. Uh-huh. And, you know, with traditional instruments, if you will, uh, maybe a synthesizer is more true, depending on what, how you feel about it. But like with a, as a, with a traditional orchestral instrument, a violin is a violin. A guitar is a guitar. You know, you might play it differently. It might be processed differently. It might have different effects on it or something. With a, with a synthesizer, at least a couple that I used, you know, you create the sounds and you have to design the sound yourself. Now there are plugins that come 
in, with modern digital recording uh, workstations that, that have presets. But I used a couple synthesizers that are so old they don't even have presets. And that really? was time consuming to find the right sound that oh. I wanted that would work. Um, and it was, it's, it was solitary, mm-hmm. like the show. I think in that rubbed off in the way the music sounded because I'd be by myself trying to get just the, what I thought would be the right sound to work for it. Um, it was fun. You know? Yeah. But it's, but, it, but I, but, but ultimately I scored it in the same way, you know, like, like as if it was an orchestral score, you know, there, the violins will be at the top and the woodwinds in the middle and they're, you know, different sounds. I, I just treated them diff, you know, as, as instruments. Mm, mm-hmm. And so you had the layering and you had the doubling and everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, X, so, X, 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 exactly. Yeah. How did you, how did you manipulate the sound with those old synthesizers and like, what are some of the things that you were, what were some of the sounds you were looking for as you were coming up with that? Um, like the sound of the place where they were, the wind and the cold and the crunchiness of the snow, the, the, the sound of his knives. Um, you know, I really wanted to get inside there. I mean, it's what you want to do when you're writing a soundtrack. I just wanted to be in there. I wanted to be in there with the set design and the, the actors and the editing and the, the writing. And I wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And that's what I love about music, that it can really create that whole world building and work so well with the picture. Yeah. It's really too. exciting. I, I agree. You know, at times it's kind of hair raising when you've got a deadline staring at you. <laughs> True. But when True. you, when you, when I, and, and there's a, just a priceless feeling when you feel like you've got it, mm. you know, like I, I've got this, this is it, you know, now many times it's not it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get feedback and have to change it, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, you know, and, and I'm well past the point where I say, you know, like, it, it, no more do you do you say things like, well, what's wrong with it or why not? You know, you just, if it's not working, it's not working. Gotcha. <laughs> so did you get any of those uh, changed cuts? Are those on the album or like any of the ones that you wish had made it into the show or are these just what made it into the show? Oh, you're, oh, you're I'm glad you asked that because there are some things that didn't make it into the show that are on the record. Really? Yeah. Oh, is it okay if I ask which one? Well, um, I, 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 I have my notes here, but I'd have to go through it. You know, just just little pieces. There's some piano things that maybe maybe the, that goes on a little longer yeah. that were cut that I felt would make it better for listening, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. weren't necessarily working for for the picture. For the it picture. needed to cut be cut. Mm-hmm. Um, so not a lot. Everything on the everything is basically there. It's just, you know, that I there were four there I call them new blood suites, which were th- th- and I wanted the 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 record to feel like you were watching the whole show from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. And that's how I made it. Yeah, it definitely has a story arc to it. Oh, the album man, that makes me so happy. Yeah, I'm glad you you caught that. Yeah. You're the first person to say I really wanted to do that. Um, I was worried that it might be too long, no. but you know, no. you don't have to listen to it all at once. Right. Exactly. Well, and speaking of listening to it, um, it's great to listen to it with headphones or in a surround sound because the mixing in this album is so fun. There's so much depth to it and there's so much. Now, what I mean by depth for the listeners who don't understand when you sit there with, with earphones on some of the sounds, some of the, I guess, tracks of it, uh, sound like they're very, very far away. And it sounds like you're in the middle of the room and everything is going on around you. That's what I mean by depth. And I've just got to know, so you worked with the mixing engineer, like what, how did you create that sort of all around depth of the mix of this album? I'm so glad you asked this because yes, I work with a mixing engineer 
and I've his name is Patrick Derivaz. And he's he's a real talent. Um, and I've worked with I've worked with him since Rocco's Modern Life. Really? Yeah, we go back. Um, he's done everything I've done, and I mean everything. He's done Bored to Death, Nurse Jackie, Rocco. Well, the last the, the last four seasons of Rocco's Modern Life. Sometimes when they're, you know, he's done everything, everything. And um, I trust him. I, I can't imagine working on something without him. And so that's really him. That's his, him taking my stuff and doing his thing on it. Really? Yeah, 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 really. Well, he did a beautiful job with it. So I'm going to tell him next time you talk to him, please. <laughs> I call him. Well, we I've got a date to call him tomorrow, but yeah, I'll tell him today. Yeah, you know, they don't get a lot of um, feedback. Really, engineer, you know, recording engineers, um, and increasingly, composers are being asked to do more of the mixing themselves. Right. I'm not that great at it. I'm getting better. I mix all the sus music myself oh, do you? Mm. maybe patrick does a couple things but i do most of it and um i ask him for advice i think maybe but um i couldn't do it without him i mean i just wouldn't i wouldn't do it without him you know i just i'm not that good at it i love collaborating also so he'll play me what he has in mind uh, and I love I love being surprised, and he 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 does that panning and all that cool stuff. It, yeah, it adds an extra layer of interest, to, and it, I think it create it makes the sounds that you've created so carefully, and just accentuates them in just the right places to really bring everything together so beautifully. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. for noticing. Oh, I loved it. It was so oh, fun. That's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Well, um, so did those types of mixes, like just one little question, follow up on the mixes, and then we'll, we'll go back to your career. Um, do those mixes end up in the show as well? Because that made it very complex. But I did notice they left the middle out for all of the dialogue, you know. So does he also help... Like, do you write and then he mixes the music and then it gets sent to the sound people in the show for them to yes. do a final mix? Yeah. I mean, we put some new mixes on there for the record. But for the most part, um, I d to be honest with you, Patrick delivers the files with, with a premix in mind. If it's too much or too wide or something they'll change it at the final mix and that can happen. You know, you put it together at the end. It's kind of like magic really, or baking a cake or something, which is its own kind of magic. You, you get a, you, you, you mix it together with the dialogue and the effects. And sometimes you're hearing things that you never noticed before. Uh, I remember the first time that happened to me on the, when I sent the music for tales from the dark side, and I, I was, I was, I was getting deep. I just thought I was doing, doing it. And, and then I watched it back on the show and there was like this jackhammer going over the score. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you know, you know, it has to be part of the, 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 the storytelling and, the, yeah. and what's happening on the screen. Well, how did you get to that point where you don't like take it personally when you've worked so hard and you have this beautiful thing that works? What's the mindset that you have to not take it personally when there's comments? Uh, I don't know what happened specifically, but you just have to be prepared. Like, like when you're done with it, when you send it out, you send that final mix out, it's just no longer yours. And, um, Luckily, I got a handle on that early on with Rocco's Modern Life. When you just you send it out, you're done, 
hopefully there's a new one that comes in um, and you do the next one. It's just, it's no longer yours. And that's sort of what's cool about it too. Uh, you get somebody else to put do their thing with it. But I, sw- I swear to you, I work with a music editor quite a bit, a woman named Missy Kahn. She didn't work on Dexter, but the other shows that you mentioned and several others. And then Missy and Nick Carr, who was a music editor on Rocco, most uh, most of the time when the edits are made, they're making it better. Mm, mm-hmm. And it's it's really exciting to have have a piece of music being transformed into something better by a music editor. That's wow. that's golden. Telling me about Rocco's Modern Life and um, and the musicians just being amazing. Yeah, I mean the the trombone player is a masterful musician named Art Barron, who was the last trombone player to be living trombone player to be in the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Really? Yeah, I'll say that again. Duke wow. Ellington Orchestra. Um, Kevin Norton, the drummer, just he made everything better. Kevin made everything better. Now, he was with Anthony Braxton. I don't know if you know who mm-hmm. Anthony is, but an avant-garde sax player. Um, Dave Hofstra played bass. And Dave was in the Ray Beats, but Dave played with everyone in Lower Manhattan, from John Zorn, Elliot Sharp, just everyone, just amazing musician. Rob DeBellis was on Woodwinds, and um, right now Rob is in the pit orchestra of uh, The Lion King, and... um, I played guitar and organ. Um, there was Kevin played drums and percussion. It was a small little band. And we would bring in other musicians, like if we needed a bagpipe player for like <laughs> one cue, we brought in a bagpipe player. Tony Trishka played the banjo on some. We brought in harmonica, Dave Douglas. They were on trumpet on some things. It, it was just a great band. Mm. Um, legendary musicians, all of them. And um, it, it was a thrill. Yeah. It was a thrill. We really looked forward and they really wanted to make it better. And they did, they made everything better. Uh, That's one of the great things about when I get to put a live band together for, for a soundtrack. Uh, I recently found all of the master tapes for Rocco and I'm just starting to, and I, Kate, Kate and Fred from the B-52s sang the theme and uh, we just had a ball. We had a ball. It's one of my favorite, it was like being inside of an engine. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) I can imagine. And it just made that show. I mean, the show was great anyway, but the music was just, it was so different from anything else at the time. And I think it really set the bar high for other shows like that. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, it was amazing. So I, I can't let you go without talking about Sus just a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I don't mind at all. Thanks. So ambient country music. I think it sounds awesome, but I would never put ambient and country together in my mind. So how, how did that generate? How did that come about? Well, I'm not going to take credit for that. (laughs) Um, Bob Holmes had the idea and put those words together. And Bob is in the band. We, we were friends. We would meet at this deli for years in Midtown well, in lower, lower Manhattan, really, uh, on Fifth Avenue, Eisenstein's. We, and we would hang out and talk about music and blah, blah, blah. And then one time, one day, Bob thought, well, maybe we should form a band. And we did. And we all loved ambient music, starting with probably Eno would come to mind. And, and, and Bob's idea 
was to combine um, Eno. What would happen if Eno and Eno, Eno Morricone were in the same <laughs> band? So Eno and Eno. Wow. And, and we all like country music. And lo and behold, there's a lot of people who are kind of doing their version of this. Really? Um, yeah, Chuck Johnson, Luke Schneider, Hayden Pedigo, a lot of really interesting musicians are taking like con- what you might consider traditional country instruments and doing something else mm-hmm. with it. But I would also include uh, John Cage, yeah, Philip Glass. Oh, yeah. Um, I love Bill Frizzell. I don't know if you know Bill. No, Bill's I'll have music, to listen. But, well... Please do. Okay. Um, yeah, Bill Bill Frizzell is, and he would he would you know he's on a jazz label. He would probably never talk, say ambient, but nor would Philip Glass. But Eno does, and there it's just a different sound. And I'm glad Sus exists, if only because at the beginning of Dexter. Dexter, you know, I knew the showrunner, Clyde Phillips, but the other producers, which who were Michael C. Hall, the actor, um, Marco Siega and Scott Reynolds, they didn't know me. They knew me as SpongeBob SquarePants and the B-52s. Mm-hmm. So they didn't really make any kind of connection to like uh-huh. Dexter. <laughs> Nothing kind of screamed out like, oh, yeah, that's our guy. <laughs> But when they heard the music of Sus, which, you know, you could point to, say, Ry Cooter's soundtrack to, say, Paris, Texas, um, or other, you know, other scores like that, um, they could hear it. They could make a connection. Well, thanks for giving Sus a spin. We've got a new record coming oh, really? out soon. Oh, yeah. When is that? Next? Next oh, goodness. Week, there'll be an EP. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. we'll put links to that um, in our show notes oh, so people can, can find it. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's a, like you said, it's, it's like the, the country instruments played in a new way. And I love, I love that. I love hearing things done in unexpected ways to make new sounds. I just get a kick out of it. So I'm excited to hear that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. So now you've been in the industry for a long time. Um, I know it's changed a lot in the last few years, where do you see, where do you see kind of the music industry or, I mean, that's such a loaded, huge question. Where do you see the, um, I guess the scoring industry and going in the future? Well, working backwards, working remotely is going to change everything. It already has, you know, being, you know, working during the COVID lockdown, um, uh, and there are advantages to working remotely, and there are some things that, speaking for myself, that I don't particularly enjoy. But I, the convenience, you can't deny it. Um, digital file sharing has changed everything. So instead of like putting a tape into FedEx and sending it to Los Angeles, you just say, load it up on right. the server. <laughs> You know, like, you know, like, you know, we'll wait for it to give me 10 minutes and I'll put it on the Internet. Right. You know, that we were doing things on Dexter in real time, which would have taken a, over a day um, by working remotely. It would be, oh, that song that's coming out of the radio isn't working that well. Can we have can you cut a verse and go right to the chorus and then put the score in and the music at our Jordan Ross would do that yeah. and send the files to the mixer um, in real time. Wow. And, you know, you got to be really pretty good right. to do that, but, but he's re- he was really good. Um, you know, so that's my answer to that root working remotely, you know, um, you know, obviously in the, the time that I've been doing this, the computer has changed everything. Uh, look what we're doing now. And um, it's just remarkable that, you know, the 
the computer has enabled so many of us to be composers and, and work with the image in the computer and sync it up. You know, in the very beginning of Rocco's Modern Life, I was actually working with just drawings. Really? And a stopwatch, uh, the storyboards. So I knew how long that scene was going to be, if it was a matter of seconds or whatever. And I would time it and write it into the score with, with the tempo. Wow. You know, when, 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 when I got hip to the computer programming, which was, you know, in, it existed, but I didn't really use it. Uh, you know, the computer loved that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And I said, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll time that for you. <laughs> so it's made it easier in some ways. Yeah, very much so. But it's but it's also, you know, there's a dangerous side to it um, in that as more and more, let's just say, sounds and digital samples of orchestral sounds primarily, drum sounds become more available, there's sort of if you're not careful, things sound the same because everybody's got the same sounds. They've got the same BBC orchestra or the same Hans Zimmer or the the same piano samples. You know, so I try to, you know, I have a piano right over here. You try try to use as much, I try to use as much of my own as possible. Um, But you can't get away from the fact that you have to move quickly and um, convenience is a factor. It's all right. It's okay. You know, it's part of the, part of the deal. But that, 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 that troubles me a little bit as more and more younger composers want to get, get in the business. Yeah. Well, uh, jumping off the back of that, what sort of advice do you have for some of these young composers that are just starting their career out? Uh, be yourself. Mm-hmm. You just can't change who you are. I, I'm not going to be Hans Zimmer anytime soon. I'm not, go- let alone Ennio Morricone or Ry Cooter. You know, I can only be myself. And I bring, I have to bring that to the table. Now, a film, the fun part about being, uh, being a composer is you get pushed into places that you didn't know you were going to go. You know, like on Rocco, you know, you, you'd have to, it could be, there was sort of an eclectic side to it, which is fun. You know, yeah, uh, bluegrass music, let me give it a try. And it'll be your own version of it, um, hopefully. Um, and, but with with a composer, you know, there's, there's a sort of a correct sound and maybe, maybe, maybe different comp- big companies. Let's say like Marvel, or maybe, maybe there's a sound that you have to have. I know there is, um, but you know, I'm not going to be the first person they call for that kind of score. Um, per what you were saying at the very beginning, I, I just sort of, I can't help it. You know, just do what I do. And I just, that's the advice I would give to a younger composer. Otherwise, you're going to chase something that isn't really there mm. or someone. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that advice. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, and also, this has sure. been such a wonderful day for me. This has been such a delight to talk with you. I so appreciate oh, cool. <laughs> I so appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. Like, thank you. Well, thanks for yeah, having me. It's been really nice for me too. Good, good. Well, I wish you all the best with uh, this, uh, with the Dexter um, album, which is out. Let me see. It is out through Lakeshore Records. It's out now. And then Sus's is yes. coming out next week, right? There's an EP on Northern Spy, which is a, a Brooklyn based label and that we're really fortunate to be a part of. And, um, and there will be more in about a month after that. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So we'll keep updated with that. 
Well, thank you, Pat Irwin. This has been just an honor for me. I have so appreciated getting to know you and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me.